Bibles, and tonight we are in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, grab one around you. There's Bibles in the chairs nearby. Grab one of those, again, with the intention that we would be here in this book. Also, when you guys came in the door, you should have been able to pick up a a little flyer that will let you kind of pre-study. I mean, that really is partly the aim on Wednesday nights, is we're hoping that you're reading and we'll be reading for next week, Galatians chapter 5. And yet I found myself thinking about it. I don't know about you, and, 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 and you know, as I was reading through these, these chapters, you know, sometimes when you're reading through some of the stuff that Paul writes, it can be a little bit difficult to understand. Now, see, I can say that because not only do I know that personally, but, hey, God actually tells us that. At least I find that to be a little bit humorous. I mean, it's there in First Peter, Second Peter, Peter's writing, and he says, Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you as in also all of his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some of them, which some things are hard to understand. Now, I don't know if that that just kind of strikes anybody else. I mean, God tells us. Sometimes Paul can be hard to understand. You know, I mean, just just, just in in case you were reading it this last week, going, man, I'm just having a hard time getting it, you know? And it's like, hey, I mean, sometimes it can be. And yet God gave it to us on purpose, gave it to us to understand. And so we approach it that way this evening, asking that God would speak to us. And so let's do that. Let's go before him. And maybe there is really a sense of saying, God, we need help to be able to understand what he, what you're saying in your word, because even though it can be difficult, God is able to open up our understanding to comprehend his truth. So let's ask for that. Would you join me there? God, thank you for your word. That is true, and that is good. What I know that you've written it to us to understand, and yet we would be wise even right now just to come humbly and say, Lord, we need you to do that. I thank you even just in my own kind of just silly humor, Lord. I love that you tell us that sometimes it can be hard to understand. I take comfort in that. And yet I also recognize, Lord, that you want us to. And I love that Jesus, when you met the disciples after the resurrection, it says you entered into that room and you opened up their understanding so they could comprehend the truth. And I simply ask, Lord, do that for us here this evening. For each of us, would you help us to understand the things that you have for us. Tonight, help us now. We ask it together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, the theme, and really many ways, that some of the things that the book of Galatians is talking to us about is legalism. So I suppose I just begin with that as a question. I'm just kind of curious if you are trapped in legalism. Now, I say that, and maybe right off the bat you understand that, but I want to tell you it's a big deal. And every Christian has struggled with it. Every Christian does struggle with it in places. And this whole book is about how to come to freedom with that. We gave some definitions last week, and so if you missed that, you might want to go back and get that study. But let me give you a very simple definition as I think it through. That as we think about what legalism is, legalism is the human effort to justify oneself before God on the basis of works. That when you define what legalism is in every capacity, is it in one sense, is to say that we are earning God's favor, we're maintaining God's favor on the basis of us. That it's the basis of our works that are bringing that about. That our works are that are causing that, and that is not the gospel. That is not the nature of it. In fact, I, I love just that simple phrase that we are saved by grace through faith. In fact, that's not in Galatians, that's actually in Ephesians, but it's put in such a a great small section. Let me go ahead and put that verse up on the screen. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That if you're a Christian here this evening, it's by God's grace, so you believing in him faith, and it's not of yourselves. You didn't do it. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amazing verse, but again, catch it in context. In fact, maybe it might be just helpful to get it this way. There's a huge, amazing contrast right here that there's a world of difference between a salvation that is of works and a salvation that is for good works. I mean, it's only a preposition, and you might think, well, is that really big, a big, that big a deal, Jim? Is a world of difference between the two. 
There's a salvation where sometimes people think it's of works, that somehow we are earning it, that somehow we are earning God's favor, that we are deserving of God's favor. And that's never what he has. And it's not that he doesn't have good works for us. He does. But those good works are supposed to flow out of our Christian life as, as, as just an overflow that God is doing it in us, but it's all him. So let's just bring it into even at this moment. It's a lot bigger than this, but so you're here this evening, and, and we're really glad that you're here. But I suppose I could ask it as simply as this. So, so why? Why are you here? Are you here to earn God's favor or enjoy His favor? Are you here this evening that somehow you think that being here is going to put God in your debt? That you're going to be able to say, God, I went to church Wednesday night. You know, you're, that means you're going to bless me tomorrow, right? I mean, I did this, so if I do that, you're going to do this for me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to church Wednesday night. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to do these things. And I'm going to do these because if I do these things, then God, you'll bless. You'll do, you'll do something in my life. And I just want to tell you, some of you, I mean, maybe we all struggle with it at times, but some of you, honestly, that's where you are. Your, your life is a set of gold stars that you're trying to constantly earn from God. You know, God, I, I, did you see me? I'm a, I'm a good boy. I'm a good girl. I did this. I did this. I did this. I did this. And somehow you think that that's what's required. Somehow you think that's the only way that, that, that God would look upon you favorably. But honestly, that makes it about you. That makes it about you. Makes it about what you're doing. And it's not what God has. Now, don't get me wrong again. We're made for good works, but they're, they're not us. I mean, God make, God's making us, God's providing it so that when we actually come, and if it's in the right place this evening, you didn't come this evening to say, God, did I get a gold star? But God, I just want to enjoy the life you've given me. I, I wonder what you have tonight. I want to, I want to walk with you. I, want to, I, I, I just want to respond. You've loved me with an incredible love that I did not deserve. I, I'm here this evening because of the overflow of God's grace in my life, and I just, I just want to respond. I just want to give this to you. I want my life to be that, and, and Lord, I'm, I'm so excited to see what you have for me. I, I, I want to walk in that, and that means you can approach your quiet time if you have one, and I hope you do, and you, you read the Bible, and it would, shouldn't be this little, you know, check mark, <laughs> did that, did my little thing that I'm supposed to do as a Christian, as if somehow you were earning God's favor, but it'd be like, God, I just want to spend time with you. And I want what you have for my life. I mean, I want, to, I want the good works that you're making for me to do. And I want to receive the life that you have for me. But I'm on the receiving end of the whole deal. I mean, my life is, is all about your grace being poured into me so that everything that I get to do, it really is grace. That's where God wants you to be. And I'm just telling you in a, in a, in a very simple way, that's not where all of us are. And God would want to rescue us. That's really the book of Galatians is to come in because that's what they were struggling with in the, in, in the, in the region of Galatia with legalism and very specifically feeling that maybe they needed to go back under the Old Testament law to maintain their favor. That they thought, well, maybe we got saved, you know, and that was good, but now we're going to have to maintain this by our works instead of recognizing it can never be that way. Well, again, that's the theme of it, and therein lies the danger. And if you're there this evening, then God would want to speak to you again and say, no, it's not that way. Salvation is grace. It is grace. It's a gift. It's a gift to be received from him, a life to be received from him. And that's what he's speaking to us about in the entire book of Galatians. Well, tonight we, we come into Galatians 4, and a little bit of the difficulty is we're right in the middle of really a, an explanation of that, that he's, ch chapter 3 and 4 of the book of Galatians is really a doctrinal understanding, it's really a, a plea for why you should not let yourself be trapped by legalism. And we covered three reasons last week, and there's three more this week. So there's six total in chapters 3 and 4, and the first, but let me just kind of give you a recap of what we saw last week, and if you want more of those, if you missed it, go back and get the study. But it began in chapter 3 by just telling us that there really was a personal reason that you should be able to defend the grace of God in your life. And in a very quick way, in one sense, what he just highlights is that you've never earned anything from God. If you're a believer here this, not, this evening, it was grace. You didn't earn it. And everything that God has ever done in your life 
has been grace. Your own personal experience is one of the greatest reasons why you should believe in God's grace, because it's always been God's grace in your life. Well, that's where he began, and as he told us that, then he continued in chapter 3 with really giving us a biblical defense, really just winding through seven scriptures that kind of showed us throughout the whole Old Testament that it was always God's plan to bring us to this moment that we would have a relationship with God by grace. It was always meant to be about promise. It was always meant to be that way, and the whole of God's plan was building to this moment. And then he really gave us what we called a logical defense or a logical argument. Now, I thought about that, and as I was thinking about it just coming into this evening, I thought, you know, I, I tend to do this with my outlines. I change them all the time. I mean, sometimes I end up changing them on the screen, and I forget to change them in your booklets, and I'll try to get better about that. But I thought, you know, I don't like, I don't like that. I don't, since I'm not sure it's clear enough, so let me just change that. In one sense, he ended chapter three by just telling us that the law had a purpose, and the law's purpose was to restrain sin to show us our sin, and ultimately bring us to Jesus. And he just reasoned with us that the Old Testament had a, an intent purpose of showing us our great need for Christ. And all of it was about bringing us to Jesus. And that's where we ended last week. Again, as I think through these six arguments, can I just be a little bit honest? I think those are the three most powerful. I think Paul begins well, just saying, hey, these are reasons why you should never let legalism rule your life. Because your own experience shows you it's never been legalism. Because the Bible's always been about bringing us to this place of God's promise, and that everything that the Bible does show us ultimately shows us our need for Jesus. So, I mean, those are incredible, rich things. And again, if you missed it, I would just encourage you, maybe just go back and read it on your own. And if you need help in that, you can get the study that we went through, and hopefully that would be of some help. But now he wants to add to it. So, it's personal, it's biblical, the law has a purpose that we need to understand, and then he gives us what I'm just calling, and it's not original with me, by the way, but kind of a dispensational defense. Dispensational defense. Let me explain that. Don't lose me. What is that? Well, let me kind of just push this up at the top just for the for, for screen sake so I have some real estate there to use. What is dispensational? Well, dispensational really is a term that's a theological term that people use to describe kind of an understanding of the way that God does it. Can I give you a very just definition of it? You don't need to write it down because you'll never be able to write it that fast. So let me just read it with you. That in one sense, dispensationalism is a theological system that teaches biblical history is best understood in light of a number of successive administrations of God's dealings with mankind, which it calls dispensations. The dispensationalism says, okay, here's the thing. God, he, he works in seasons of history in very different ways. There are ways in, in, in human history where what's been there was a, a way that God did it. Now, theologians actually go through and find literally somewhere between seven or eight possible dispensations. And so I'm going to give it to you really rapidly. Again, you, there's no test on this. And you probably won't be able to write it down that fast if you're taking notes, but it might, because somebody's going to ask, so what are the seven dispensations or eight dispensations? Well, if you think about history, it really begins this way, that there was a dispensation in the Garden of Eden, that before man fell, there was a, a relationship, a, a way that God had described for mankind to, to relate to him. And in many ways, it was enjoy everything, just don't eat the tree. Don't, don't, don't eat that. that was the relationship, that was the nature of it, and then there was the fall. And that brings us into what the theologians kind of call the Adamic dispensation, or really from the, the time of Adam all the way to Noah, that the understanding of who God is and, and how he was working really falls into that category. And then something happens, some radical happenings happen at Noah, so they really would define that after Noah's time, I mean, because some really major things happen both within creation and in the world, and so they would call it the Noetic uh, dispensation that would really run from Noah to Abraham. When Abraham comes on the scene in Genesis 17, it, it's a new generation. I mean, God begins working not just throughout all, but it begins to pursue that work in Abraham that really would be the foundation of the Jewish people and the history that's in there. So there really is this kind of Abrahamic dispensation that from Abraham to Moses, which it told us in our text last week was 432 years. I mean, for 432 years, there is this beginning of this work that God is working with the Jewish people. They don't have an Old Testament yet. They don't have the Ten Commandments yet. They don't have the Old Testament law yet. There is this work that is really defined around Abraham and the promises to Abraham. 
But then Moses comes on the scene and leads the children of Israel out of Egypt, and that really moves them into the law dispensation that would really take place from the time of Moses to the time of Christ. That, that the, the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments, the, the laws that God brings in there really form this dispensation of the purpose of the law, which again is so foundational to where we are in the book of Galatians. That brings us to today. We are in this grace dispensation where it's by grace that we're saved, not by the law, that it's really Jesus, that it's all about Jesus. And then there are perhaps two more dispensations coming. Uh, really the millennium that's going to take place where God's work in a thousand-year reign that God promises in the book of Revelation really is going to define a different way that he's working, working through the nation of Israel once more, a believing nation, some radical changes that are going to be different than the way it is now, and that will finally take us to the kind of the heavenly dispensation or really just heaven. I mean, everything's going to be different. And again, you don't need to remember all that, but in one sense, there is this sense, of, well, yeah, that makes sense. It, it's they're, 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 What God did in that generation and that season of history was different sometimes than he did in other seasons. And really that's drawing us to the, the, the two that really find us where we are this evening, that the law was given, the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments, the things that Moses were there, that was given on purpose. And it was given on purpose to show us our sin, to show mankind their sin. Again, that's where he ended in chapter 3, but we're in a different dispensation. We're no longer there. That's not where God is dealing with mankind. That's not the way that he's working today. And he wants us to understand that. So let's read it. (laughs) Got your Bibles there in chapter 4, verse 1. It says it this way, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child. Actually, you know what? I'm going to back up. Would you back up with me to chapter 3 just for a moment? Go to chapter 3. Oh, let's just pick it up. Hmm in verse 21. It's a little bit just lengthy, but I think it, he's building the argument that flows into where we are, so I need to read it. He says, is the law against the promises of God? I mean, is the law bad? Certainly not. For there, if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. I mean, if the law could have saved people, then that would have been the way that God did it. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were under the guard of the law. I mean, before we had this, before Jesus came and died for our sins, the law was there guarding, hindering, protecting. It says, you know, kept for the faith, which would afterwards be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law was our tutor. I mean, maybe it might be best to understand that. I mean, it has the idea of our one that would teach us, kind of the one that we, we might even say our nanny. I mean, it kind of is that. It's not just like, you know, an after-school tutor kind of thing, but it's one that had responsibility over us to raise us, to bring us along uh, the, the place. He says, that's what the law was there for. But after faith has come, we are no, no longer under a tutor. He says, after we come to faith, we're no longer, you know, under that law. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now, I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. So as you think about it this way, you have a child and maybe he's a, you know, born into, to be a millionaire's child. You know, he's like, that's great, but you know what? He's not going to get that inheritance until after he grows up. I mean, as he says, you know, he's at, he, to, till that point that he, he reached that, that coming of age, until that appointed time, you know, he he's, he, he's really doesn't have all the benefits and blessings that will be his by position says, you know, he's under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, verse 3, we, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. It says, at the very right time, at the perfect time, Jesus came. That's just, I mean, there's so much there because God is always right on time. 
But I mean, that dispensation, the change between he was working the Old Testament to the New, I mean, Jesus came at the right time, born under the law, fulfilling everything that was there, and there's a hundred things that flow into that, but there's just a perfect way that God is working. So when Jesus came, he came to redeem us. He came to, to, to bring us out from under the law. Verse 6, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Okay, there's a bunch in there, but I'm just going to highlight a couple of quick thoughts. I mean, here's what he's wanting to make sure we understand, that our relationship with God, we're no longer slaves. I mean, this is you were that. You were a slave. You were under bondage. I mean, you were under bondage of sin. You were under the bondage in the world, under bondage of the law. And he says it again this way, but, you know, again, as he lays it out to us, there in verse 7, therefore you are no longer. I mean, that's not the way that God's working with us. No longer a slave. He says, instead, you're a son. Instead, you're a child of God. He says, he says you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. In many ways, what he's just telling us is that being a son is so much better. I mean, that's like a way big understatement. But, you know, it's worth just making sure I pause and say this. I hope you understand that that's massive. I mean, it's massive. That God would do a work in us that would bring us to a relationship with God where we get to be his kids. That's massive. And that's not everybody's. I, I need to just make sure I make this clear because we live in a world that sometimes gets this all backwards where sometimes they'll say, well, you know, we're all God's children. <laughs> I mean, everybody in the world is God's children. No, we're not. No, we're not. We are God's creation, but we're not his children. No, to, to be a child of God, there is only one way, and that's through Jesus. See, it tells us in, the, in John's gospel in chapter 1, but as many as received him, that is receiving Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God. We weren't children of God. <laughs> But we were slaves, and we were slaves of, of sin, slaves in the world. But and we believed in Jesus, we now have the privilege, and we have the right to become a child of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's not your, you know, who you're born into. It's not your parents. It's not, you know, others' decisions. It's, 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 it's God working a work in your life. And if you're his, it's this amazing thing. He said, we've been given the right to be God's kids, and it's amazing. First John says it this way, and you know, it says, behold, and which is one of those words like, hey, check this out. Look at this. This is amazing. I mean, gaze upon this. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because they didn't know him. It, they don't grab this. They don't understand all that it is. But we have something amazing. One of the things that should rescue you from, 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 from legalism is embracing who you are in this. Like, I'm a, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a slave. That's not the relationship I have with God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God, and that changes everything. In fact, the way that he does it is absolutely incredible. You, you already heard me read it, but I want to just read it again. Go there in verse 6. It says, and because you're sons, because you're a child of God, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. This is because of where, how this works now to be a child of God, to be this incredible thing that Jesus has done in us. Now the Spirit of God is inside us. That was never the place before Jesus. I mean, now what happens is that God, the Spirit of God takes up residence inside us in a way that defines who we are. Where Romans 8 would say, if you don't have the Spirit, you're not His. Because He's everything that we are. Now God takes up residence inside us, and, and now He becomes the one that empowers us. The Spirit is working in our hearts to cause us to cry out, Abba, Father. It's an amazing verse, and again, just bring it to you briefly. Abba, you might already know, that's Aramaic, and it really would be the closest equivalent we could get out of that, and our English translation would probably be Papa or Daddy. I mean, if you would even go over even today, you know, and, and walk around in, in some of the places where they still speak Aramaic in the Middle East, you would hear them. You know, hear, you know, a little kid walking around going, Abba, Abba. <laughs> I mean, just calling out for his dad. And he says, here's something that God is doing in you so that the relationship you have with him, it's not one based on fear. You're not a slave that's like, okay, he's going to beat me at any moment. I just know that. You know, if I don't, if I don't perform 100%, I'm done. Instead, it's like, no, he's, he's working in us so that 
we begin to want to do the right thing and have this relationship with God. And the power of that is God himself. Hey, can I just take this even one step further? Because for somebody here this evening, this is really what you need to hear. Because maybe you sit here this evening and you're like, but Jim, I feel kind of emotionally bankrupt. I mean, I don't feel like I'm really, I mean, my whole life has been a mess. And, and so, I mean, God, you're saying I'm supposed to have this relationship with God where I know him as my, as my father, as I get to call him Abba. I mean, I'm just not sure that I'm able to do that. I'm not sure that I can have that kind of relationship with God, my, the, the mess that I've had. And I want to just once more point out to you, he's not asking you to do it. He's saying he'll do it. He says the Holy Spirit within you will be drawing you, compelling you into this relationship. And I don't know about anybody else, I take great delight in that, and I ask for it often. It's like, Lord, just take this hard heart, take some of what I feel I can be cold, and I want that. I want, I want this relationship where you're my heavenly Father, where I'm, my life is being lived out of love for you that's being compelled not by this external law that could never have made me what I was supposed to be anyway, but by what you're just drawing me to be from the inside out. You're compelling me by love and this relationship, and that's what God is doing. I mean, he's doing this incredible real thing. As Paul lays that out, he says it this way in verse 8. He says, but then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. I say, before you knew God, you, you lived and served crazy things. But now, after you have known God, or rather, he says, better saying it, are, are known by God. I mean, it's not just that you know God, God knows you. And he's brought you into this amazing relationship. He says, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. He says, I'm afraid of you, lest I have labored for you in vain. He says, why would you do this? What would make you think, I, I'm going to go and have this legalistic relationship with God when God has rescued you from that? Why in the world would you go back under rules and regulations? Why would you live your life making your quiet time a check mark, going to ch church, gold star? Why would you do that? Why would you go back under those things that never saved anybody in the first place? Why would you not go and say, God, I, I want this grace relationship. I want not by me, but by you. I want you to just draw me to this relationship where it just, it flows outside of what you're doing and me. Why would you choose less than that? Hey, don't. <laughs> don't. Don't go back under that. Don't go back under again a bondage because that is not the way that God is working in this generation. It was 2,500 years ago before Jesus died on the cross. I mean, that's all they had was the law and the law was necessary but it's not so for you. And he's calling you to something incredibly better than that. And so he lays it out to us, and there's much to say there, but I just tell you again, it's so much better what you have in Christ. As he gives this to that, he adds to it another defense, kind of the fifth one in the midst of it, and it's really just a passionate defense. A passionate defense, and this is where, you know, Paul's kind of explained it in detail. Now he's just, he's just pleading with them. I mean, it's almost as if you could hear his voice crack, as if he would just, I mean, just be looking at him and a tear in his eye as he's just saying, guys, I don't want you to do this. Here are his words. It says in verse 12, brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You've not injured me at all. He says, guys, I just want, I, I want you to be like me. I want you to follow, follow me. I mean, I came and I, I, I didn't, I, I kind of turned away from the Jewish ways. He says, and I, I'm pleading with you. And, he, and, he, and he, make, he just adds this little quick thought. He says, you haven't injured me. In other words, he's not approaching them right now as like, you hurt my feelings. <laughs> you know, he's not trying to manipulate them right now. He's saying, no, I just, I'm so, I, I, I want good for your life. This, is not a, this isn't about you hurting my feelings or any of those things. He goes on to say in verse 13, you know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first, and my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What, what then, what, what blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? 
there's a bunch of things there that this is really the only place we have listed for us. We don't know how the whole story worked out. We just know that Paul preached in Galatia. He says, you know, one of the reasons I was there is because I was sick. I, not, there was something happened, maybe even an eye disease, because he says, you would have plucked out your eye and given it to me. He says, you knew, I mean, it's one of the reasons I was there. He says, don't you remember the relationship we had? I mean, there I was, and you guys were so, I mean, you treated me with such tenderness, with such kindness. You received me as, I mean, way beyond what, was, what I would deserve. So much so, I think if you, if you could have given me your own eye, you would have done it. And again, there's a lot of interesting history in the Paul's, Paul's life that does this. But again, in, in this connection, he's just appealing to the relationship they had. He says, don't you remember? And he says, that, that, I'm, I'm, I'm appealing on the basis of that relationship. You know, why are you mad at me now if I'm telling you the truth? Because I, I, I'm, I'm longing to come in the same relationship. Tells us there in, in, in verse 17, they zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that they may be zealous for that you may be zealous for them. It says these false teachers, they're, they're, they're zealous so that you could be excited for them and you could be about their works and, and, and doing that. He says it's good to be zealous and a good thing always. Not only when I'm present with you, he says the problem isn't being passionate, the problem isn't being zealous, but getting hooked into this legalistic tendency where they were beginning to get hoodwinked into. He says, My little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be present with you now and change my tone. I have my doubts about you. He says, I just so, I, I, I'm laboring again because I just want to see Christ in you. I feel like I'm saying it all over again that I just want it to be about Jesus in your life. I mean, it's kind of the, the key issue, right? I mean, it's what we talked about in Colossians. It's all through the Bible. It says, I don't want it to be about the law or legalism. I want it to be about Jesus in your life. I want it to be about Christ being formed inside you, being changed on the inside out, and that being the life that you're living, and I don't want you to get robbed. And then he just tells him, he says, you know, but I, there's just this loving, concerned tone where he says, you know, I, I, I would love to be there and, and not to be able to be so worried about you and not be able to, you know, speak so hardly, but he says, you know, the, the, the thing is, you know, I, I've become really worried about you. You know, he says, that, you know, again, I would like to be present with you and change my tone, for I have my doubts. I have my doubts about you. He says, I'm really worried that you're not listening to me. I'm really worried that, though I'm saying it as carefully and as passionately as I can possibly say it, I'm just, I'm concerned that you're still not listening. And I wonder the same. I wonder if you're here this evening and I'm trying to lay out to you the wonder of grace, the wonder of the relationship that God wants with you. And I wonder if you'd just be like, yeah, yeah, that doesn't really work for me. <laughs> I mean, rules and regulations work for me. You know, and then there's this really cool new teaching over here that's going to, you know, make us Jewish again or go back under the law. And I'm just, I, I just want to tell you, no, don't, don't go. I mean, it's Jesus that you need, and, and I so long that you would hear it, and, and, and Paul so longs it, he just longs for that. And so he gives them this passionate defense as if you could just hear his voice cracking as he's saying it. And then he gives them one more. And it's really kind of an illustrative defense. It really is... It's almost like a, a good sermon, I suppose, in one sense. You know, he's been passionate now, and now he's going to end with a story. He wants to just give them an illustration out of the Old Testament that if they, if, if they didn't get it now, maybe a picture, maybe a story will tell it to him. So he says it this way. Verse 21, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. Let me just pause there, and I, I want to make sure that I don't lose you and just tell you, I hope you know the story. I hope you know the story that's found there in the book of Genesis, but let me give it to you in very fast fashion. Let me just kind of put a map up on the screen and just imagine it with me, if you will. Genesis 17, we, we find Abraham there in Ur of the Chaldees, modern-day Babylon over there, and God calls him. God calls him, calls him out of the Ur of Chaldees. Abraham and Sarah, they're there together. They hear the call of God and they begin to make that journey. It's not a quick journey and they don't necessarily go without hiccups, but eventually they get over to the promised land. They get over to the promised land, the place where God's blessing is supposed to be for them, where God has called them to be, and as soon as they get there, there's a famine. It gets difficult, as often is the case when we make a step of obedience. I mean, it just, they run into problems and they run away. They get right there, and it gets difficult, and they run away to Egypt. 
And if you know the story, Abraham lies about his, his wife, and he's like, oh, yeah, she's my sister, and, you know, the Pharaoh almost takes her, and God has to rescue him, and God has to do this crazy cool thing where he rescues him in the midst of it, and they end up going back, but before they go back, they do something. They gain a, a servant named Hagar, who becomes a, a servant that would be Sarah's maid servant out of that, and they make their way back over to the, to the land of Israel, and there they wait. They wait for God to fulfill his promises, which a lot of God's promise was that Abraham would have a son and that through his son would be the blessing, that eventually the promise to bless the whole world would happen through his son. And months pass, and years pass, and it's not happening. <laughs> it's not happening. And finally, Abraham and Sarah are having this conversation like, you know, I don't know, man. maybe it's not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, poor God, he's probably got himself in a pickle, you know, now Abraham, you know, he gets to the place where Sarah can't have kids any longer, and Abraham, he's, he's old, you know, it kind of tells us in, in, in the book of Romans, they're like, I don't know what we're going to do, and they, they decide, you know what, maybe we need to help God out. You know what, there is this custom that's not, it's not biblical, but it's a custom over in Egypt and other places that maybe you should take my maid as your wife, and she can have a child, and it will kind of be like me having a child. And so they take Hagar, and she becomes Abraham's wife, and she bears a son named Ishmael. Ishmael that that would become just kind of that descendant that's through that. But God says no. Abraham's like, you know what, just bless Ishmael. God, I mean, here I gave you a son. And God's, no, that's not my promise. That's not the son of my promise. I'm going to give you a son through Sarah, and miraculously she ends up bearing a child. Isaac is born, he becomes the son of promise. And so you have these two children, which is the story that's being laid out to us. And he tells us, okay, here's what we have. Verse 22, it's written that Abraham had two sons, the one of a bondwoman. He says, you know, Ishmael, he's he's the son of a slave. He's a a son of a bondwoman. It's a son born in that framework of slavery. He says the other is a free woman. That's really Sarah, that she has Isaac, and and the son would be born there. He says he was born of the bondwoman, was born according to the flesh, and the one of the free woman through promise. He says, when you think about it, this Ishmael, he's born according to the flesh. I mean, this is what the flesh could produce. It's like, this is what the flesh does. And he says, that's what it is. But Isaac's a son of promise. It's a promise of this is what God's going to do. This is a book of God's blessing and, and his promise. He says, these things are symbolic. I mean, they, they literally happened, but they form this type, this picture for us. For these two are two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, which corresponds to Jerusalem. Hey, that's a mouthful. I'm not even going to unpack it all for you. But in one sense, he's saying that's kind of like the whole thing of the law. I mean, Hagar becomes this picture of, of what that is and how that works. But he says, but Jerusalem from above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, rejoice, O barren, you who, who do not bear. Break forth and shout, for you are not in labor. For the desolate has borne many, more children than she who has a husband. So he really takes this promise that would you know, come from the book of Isaiah and just say, okay, here's what's going to happen. God's going to do something, and he's going to bring family into this, you know, not through birth. It's going to be this amazing thing, which he tells us is a picture of where we are. It says in verse 28, now we brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. It says, even so, that's the way it works. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Hey, some crazy cool details in there, but in one sense, he says, here's what's going to happen. Ishmael, I mean, he's he's not going to be an heir. That's not where God's blessings are going to come. That's a work of the flesh. That's what the flesh does. I mean, you think about it. I mean, Islam and everything else flows right through that vein. I mean, from Muhammad and all that, I mean, that's kind of, I mean, everything in that, the, the, the pain that comes, that says that's not going to get God's blessings. But over here, we're sons. We're children. I mean, that's the place that God wants us to be. And in one sense, he's just given it to us as a picture. And, and, and I wish I could say it better than that, but it's a crazy cool picture. And maybe for somebody, it, could, it will just grab you in a way that nothing else I said does. It's like, okay, so which one do you want to be? You, you, you want to be like Isaac? You want to be like Ishmael? You want, you want to come to the place of God's blessing and his promises and God's, you know, pouring out his work where it's God's blessing and God's work in your life? Or do you want to do a work of the flesh and it be a mess all the days of your life? 
It's like, I don't, I don't want to be Ishmael. <laughs> I don't want to go that way. I'd like, I want to be the problem. And that's what God is in Christ. He's calling us again to that and saying that's where we need to come and, and that's the life that God has for us. And there's some crazy cool things behind this. I mean, think about it this way. Those there in Galatia were struggling with legalism and they were kind of desiring to go back under the law, under this. And God says, you do that, you're really Abraham's. I mean, you're really Ishmael's descendants, not Isaac's, because that's not what God has for you. Well, much more I could say, but let me just begin to pull us towards a close here this evening and say, okay, here's the thing. And he's just kind of reasoning with him, saying, you know, hey, it is salvation by grace. It is through faith. Don't let anybody lead you a different direction. I mean, your own experience is this. The Bible is this. I mean, that's what the laws was there for. And it's the, the way that God is working today. And I just want to ask you again. You see, I, I asked you at the beginning, and I ask you now as we move towards our close, are you there? I mean, it would be a crazy thing to kind of go through this and, and then leave here thinking, yep, that's what I'm going to leave do. I'm going to go be Ishmael. <laughs> I'm going to go try to earn God's favor in my flesh. I'm going to go strive to do what God, you know, what, what I, it's like that would be a crazy thing to walk out of here doing. Instead of saying, God, I, I don't want that. I want, I want your work where you bless, where it's your promise, where it's not my work, it's your work. Where my Christian life isn't about me earning your favor. It's about me enjoying your favor. It's about me walking out the life that you have for me. So I want to give it to you, and I, just, I think the verses said it well, and I'll put it as a picture as we close on the screen, and I just love the way that the concept is where he says, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the, the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. He says, you're, you're, you're a child of God. God is doing a different work where he's drawing you to him in a relationship, where he's drawing it to you, where you know him. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. That's the relationship God wants you to have with him. Not a legalistic, earning God's favor, but a child of God. Walking by him producing good works in you by his power. I hope that's where you are this evening. If that's not, I just wanted to tell you that's where God wants to bring you. So let's close. You can take your Bibles and close them, and let's just ask God that he would bring us after that relationship that is defined by God sending his spirit into our hearts. God, I love what you've done to be children of promise, to, to be those who would not be earning your favor, not a work of the flesh, but what you would do in us. I love that this was always your plan, and I love where you've brought us to in Christ. God, look upon us right now, and you see it so clearly, where legalism is present right here and right now. Would you rescue? Would you turn us away from earning and trying to do a work in our own strength, thinking that that's somehow how we maintain this relationship with you, when it is not? Instead, would you form us and shape us to be that workmanship of Christ? Would you go before us and prepare the good works that you'd have us to walk in? Would you just even now do this work that you said that you would pour your spirit inside of us so that we would cry out, Abba, Father, that it would not be an external legalistic structure on the outside. It would be a passion it would be a relationship. It would be love on the inside that brings us into a relationship that the law never could ever have produced. Would that be where we are with you? Would you draw us to enjoy what it is to be an heir of God in Christ? To be a child of God, behold what manner of love there is that we get to be called your kids. Help us to know that. Rescue us from legalism and draw us to relationship everyone here, I ask for it in the name of Jesus. Keeper of the stars Lord of time and space I will live my life Lifting up your name 
lover of my heart God who came to save thank you for the cross and the life you gave wonderful powerful Jesus is your name hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus you are the everlasting God hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus my Lord beautiful you are author of my life friend of sinful man holy mighty God ever great I am lover of my heart God who came to save thank you for the cross and the life you gave wonderful powerful merciful you are beautiful wonderful powerful Jesus is your name hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus you are the everlasting God hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus my Lord beautiful you are Hallelujah, Jesus, my Lord, beautiful you are. So I'll stand for this last one. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of a nation. Savior. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures. 
feel my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in now I surrender Savior Savior he can move the mountains my God is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave shine your light Shine your light and let the whole world see. Singing for the glory of the risen King Jesus. Shine your light and let the whole world see. Singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Oh, Lord Jesus, we rejoice in who you are and in all that you've done. You are the author of salvation, Lord. You've brought us into this incredible relationship, a salvation, Lord, that is by grace through faith. And I thank you for the word that we've heard today. And I just ask, Lord, that you would guard any. You would keep any, Lord, just from entering back into a relationship that is based on legalism and, and bondage, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that whom the Son sets free is free Indeed. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.